right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Come right back toward the hole. Seventeen years later, Hal Sutton is the Players' Champion. Well, he's got it going right at the black stick. Be up. Yeah. It is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. Super excited about our next guest, Mr. Dave Stockton. Dave is an 11-time PGA Tour winner. He won 14 times on the Champions Tour. Ryder Cup captain known for a great short game, and he's also one of the best short game and putting instructors in the country. So, Mr. Dave Stockton, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Chase. Good to be with you. So what's been going on, Dave? Well, it's hunting season, so this I get interested for about three months now. So the uh, golf's taking a back burner, although we've done a couple of corporate outings here recently, been a congressional, and uh, the boys and I were at Riviera last week, and uh, you know Riviera quite well. And uh, yeah. I, I came to the conclusion that you don't go back to a tournament you won on the golf course 50 years after the fact and think you could still play it. That was, that was seeing Riviera was a disaster. I mean, it, the golf course is so tough compared to what I remember it, that uh, it's uh, really, really, really in beautiful shape. It, it's fantastic. Well, uh, 50 years later, you had a different game 50 years ago too, Dave. Well, I was still short, but I was, and I was crooked, but the short game was a lot better too. But you remember, <laughs> you remember number nine at, at, at Riviera? Of course. Yeah, well, you could blow it over the left bunker, but I had to hit it up the right because I knew I couldn't get over it. And Ronnie and I are playing it last Tuesday, and I asked him, I said, the right bunker that I never even considered, I said, what's the carry on that? And he said, 188. Uh-huh, yours truly couldn't get it over 188. And I drove <laughs> up the bunker. I said, Ronnie, go pick up that ball. I've had it. I've <laughs> uh, Times change. So how much do you play these days, Dave? Uh I've been playing a little bit more. I was going to say maybe three or four times a month, but uh, when COVID started uh, a couple of years ago now, I, I re helped redesign our golf course here at Redlands and I started playing. I hadn't had a handicap or anything and um, took me a while to get the swing, and get it back, but it, it felt great. And I've had a couple of issues. I hadn't played in about six weeks here and, uh, God, I came back and I tell you what, it's just shorter. I mean, I kid that I can hear the ball land after I hit a tee shot, but it's, it's coming true. You know, I don't care how good my short game is. If I can't get to any, well, let's put it this way. I, I didn't break 80 the other day and I hit every single fairway. It's just, it's not, the length is gone. Whatever length I used to have anyway. Well, it's one thing's for certain. Uh, I see it every day whenever I go play it's, much closer to me when I get to it, you know, off of the tee than it ever used to be. Right. And that's what you're describing. I think we're, we're, we're trending the wrong direction. <laughs> now chase on the other hand, chase can hit it about three fifty, So he's got no problems with all that stuff. <laughs> My problem that, would, is that, that would have been nice to have. <laughs> My problem is I can't find it after I hit it. That's, that's the issue for me. Yeah. That's yeah, not true. Well, you, both both you guys could nail it a mile. I mean, I remember one of my highlights was my my wife gave me fits because I used to give Jerry Barber trouble for you know taking a spot as a past PGA champion, and uh, I I led the tour one year in driving shortness at two forty three. So you guys you guys could hit an iron that far. So it uh, looking back on it though, Hal, I mean you, you had to get it done one way or the other, and. Uh, We've certainly led a charm life. This has been a great life for both of us. And uh, it's been fun. It's fun to get back and talk to you again. It's been a while. It has been a while, Dave. We, you and I used to be 
pretty friendly out there, you know, and then we, as we were talking before we went on air, we, uh, I cherish our old friendships, you know, it's not the same. We used to depend on seeing each other every week and, or the weeks that we were out there and we just, neither one of us are out there anymore. You know, it, it, it's really true. And it's a weird part of the life is that all our friends are on tour. So you'd come home for, well, like coming up on Thanksgiving now or Christmas or whatever. And, um, you know, I have friends here at home, but they're not like my close friends that were on tour. And those are the friendships. I mean, we made a bond and that's, that's, that was special. I mean, it just, it, the places we got to play, but the people you met from all around the world. And now, of course, it's much more of a world tour than when you and I played. But uh, I, the, the camaraderie between golfers is very special. Yes, it is. So how much are you teaching these? I mean, now, all the monthly? Pros, no, no. All the pros are, you know, seem to be fine. I haven't, uh, you know, haven't worked with any Molinari or, or McElroy. McElroy now for over three years. Uh and there's just still things that I see that I wish I wish he would clean up, but it's just uh, that's kind of, kind of behind me, I guess. I'm teaching a lot of amateurs, a lot of uh, younger pros off other tours and stuff. Uh, I've tried to cut back a little bit, but I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the. I, I think looking you're the same way, probably. I mean, when you when you play competitive, you have to be selfish, and yet when you you're teaching somebody and they have tremendous success. I mean, I just gentlemen that I work with couple of times just won the the Irish senior amateur championship uh for I mean the guy's like 55 and he could flat play and uh just had a little trouble with the putting and it's just fun it's fun to keep in, involved in the game in that respect and I know my dad's looking down uh, he's got to be prouder of what I've done as a teacher than what I did accomplish as a player because you're passing on what you know your knowledge Dave, you, yeah. you mentioned Rory and, and his, something you saw in his stroke that you wish you would do. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it's just I, I'm, I'm seeing different parts. He t obviously, he, he tends to stop his stroke going through a little bit. Uh, but what I, you know, and I haven't talked to him about it or anything, but I, I see movement with his left knee at impact. And when you're putting, you, you want to keep still. You want to set your legs, you feel it in your thighs, and you just sit there so that your body's not moving. You're not, even on a longer putt, you're not rotating through like you would on a long shots. And his his left knee will, will just tend to, to move a fraction at that moment of impact, which if you stop quickly, a lot of times that'll open or close your, your club face. And it drives me nuts because there's nobody I root harder for. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping that he... He finds it at some point in time because, to me, I, I think he's one of the very special people I met in golf because he's – I know he's never going to change. I mean, I, that's something I think Hal probably appreciates too. I always appreciate the honesty of people that got more successful, but all of a sudden they didn't try to solve all the world's problems because they – now they're winning tournaments. They must be a hell of a lot smarter than they used to be, and that's not true. And McElroy is a statesman that's going to – go down in history as one of the best golfers that ever played. Yeah, I would agree with that. And he, you know, I always root for Rory as well. He, he seems to be a really clean act basically. And yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're, if you're a, 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 some, an interviewer, you want to interview him because he's going to, he's going to answer your question. He's going to look you right in the eye. He's going to tell you what he feels. And it's just a special I mean, I, I, it's one of the things I look back on my teaching. I mean, the two or three years I worked with him, uh, well, he won four majors right right in a row. And it, it basically was more of a mental exercise with him than it was physical. I always thought his putting stroke was great. And I'd never, I, would, I could not believe anybody could swing that hard to golf ball and hold his finish every single time. I mean, since I fall, fell all over the place during my swing, uh, it was special for me to see, and I started working with him two uh, two weeks after he um, had the trouble with the houses to the left on number ten at the Masters and blew the Masters. And I met with him two weeks after that at, at Charlotte at Quail Hollow. And his his JP his cat JB his caddy at the time set it up, and we met in the locker room there. And uh, say he, his caddy told me he didn't want to putt, but he wanted to talk to me. And his opening question to me was, did I see the Masters? And I said, yeah. And he said, what would you think? 
And I startled him because I said, well, I just thought you had a terrible pairing. And he looked at me like, what does that mean? And I explained, you, you're pairing with Cabrera of Argentina. And I never saw two people that didn't know how to pace themselves. You got nobody behind you. You're in the last group. And yet you're standing there waiting. And then you hit your shot. And you rush down to it. And then you get to wait again. And I just explained to him that there's certain ways. At certain times, you got to play slower, certain times faster. In his case, you had to worry about going faster because he plays at a great pace. But I just told him the next time you get in this situation, you have to try to slow yourself down so that you, you can talk to people, you can do whatever you want. But but don't be don't be having a terrible rush to get to the next ball. Well, you know, four weeks later, six five weeks later, he's at congressional where I won my second PGA, and he's you know the he I ta I saw his putting because I'd seen him a couple of weeks after that. And it, it looked perfect to me. And he had like a four shot lead, three or four shot lead. And he came to the 10th hole, which is a par three at Congressional, the way they played it. And he had 202 10, and he's hitting seven iron, which I'm laughing because I'd be hitting a fairway wood at it. And he uh, hit it about three inches, tapped it in, and the other guy, two putts. And he starts to walk off the green to go to 11, which is a terribly difficult par four. And next thing he did, he turned around and came back up on the green with his putter in his hand, no ball. And he's making these putting strokes, looking over at 18 and looking at the people. And he spent about 10 minutes there. And all of a sudden I heard his caddy yell to him and he went down to the 11th tee and within 15 seconds, his, his ball was in the air. And of course he won by eight and everybody else thinks he's going to collapse like he did at the Masters, and he just blew him away. And, you know, that's kind of the teaching I enjoyed because you're getting inside their head. You're letting them create how they want to do something but you can see immediate results. And the, the same thing happened the following year at Kiowa. Uh, I saw him at Firestone the week before Kiowa for the PGA. And we're leaving the, the practice tee on Wednesday. I'm going to Minnesota to play. And I, I asked him, can I, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, do me a favor, because I'm, I'm watching you on television. And I, can, I can tell whether you're, you're unhappy or happy or you, you know, you're, you're not in the right frame of mind. I said, do me a favor and don't care where the thing goes this week. And he finished fifth at, at Akron, goes to Kia Kiowa. I told him the same thing. It's going to be tougher here, but don't change your demeanor. I mean, just be your happy-go-lucky self. Don't upset on bad shots. And, of course, he wins by eight again. And with a concluding of 77 on Friday when they had the bad weather go through. But he wins the, both those majors by eight shots. And that's the talent I think is there. It's still there. And it's going to come out again. And when they do, the people are going to pay the price because he's, you know, he's very special. So this is an interesting question, and I want your take on this. Why do you think golfers, especially really good golfers, professional level golfers, can't stick with the same teacher when they're having success? They think someone else is going to have uh, a new idea, a new something new that might make them even better. Why do, why do you think we struggle with that? that, that that's a tough question. I, I think it starts when we're younger, Al. I mean, even, you know, golfers tend to look for the, the next biggest thing or the next thing that can help them. My dad, who never let me read golf magazines or anything like that, he just taught me how to play. And my game was different than everybody else, but I knew what my game was and I knew what my capabilities were. And I think the, the tendency, well, I, <laughs> the other side of the coin you just asked me is Mickelson. How about Mickelson working with me on putting and Dave Pels at the same time? Right. And I just shake, I shook my head. I mean, I, I feel smart enough. He can compartmentalize that. But I mean, he he come back and he'd ask me a question. He'd go like, "What do you think's the toughest thing, a downhill putt or an uphill putt?" And I'm going, "Oh my God, he's been to Pell's again." So then I'm thinking, "Well, he's obviously going to say a downhill putt." So I said, "Well, it's an uphill putt." And he goes, "Well, that's not right." I said, "It sure is right." I said, "You're aggressive like I am. If you have a downhill putt and you knock it five feet by, at least you saw what it did. You have an uphill putt and you hit it five feet by. Now you got a downhill putt. So that's why I'm saying the uphill putt's tougher." And he just kind of shakes his head, but he knew I was right. You know, it's it, that kind of thing. But I think in, in trying to get, well, we know David DeBall. David DeBall was number one in the world, but tried to keep up with Tiger off the golf course physically and really cost himself. 
And there's so many of us that that happens to, and it's just, you're almost, I, I, I look at the other side of the coin. How lucky is Jim Furyk that he's got a terrible swing? His dad, Mike's a great teacher. He taught him how to swing. He's still the only guy that's had two rounds in the fifties. He had a 58 and a 59. And yet everybody thinks, well, geez, if you just fix the swing, he could be a hell of a player. Same with Miller Barber, you know, this type of thing. So I don't know. You got to be happy in your own skin, but some perfectionists, uh, this is an awful tough game for a perfectionist to keep trying to get better and better. And I think Rory, well, Rory is the latest one trying to follow DeChambeau and he's backed away. And now it's great to hear his last talk when he won the tournament, the last tournament he just won, when he said, you know, I realize that I'm good enough. I can win with what I got. And that'll bode well for him. Yeah, that, that will be. If he sticks to that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> That's the I, hardest part. That's kind of my question that, you know, yeah, but I, I think I think he has, and I think that's probably what happened between us. I've never talked to him about it, but all of a sudden, you know, he had somebody else and drove me nuts because I saw him on the green with a whole bunch of, bunch of putting devices at the TPC there in uh, Jacksonville. And I'm going, wow, he's gone, you know, in, in, the, in trying to get better and trying to improve, which you can't fault that. But like you say, I mean, that's a, that's a slippery slope when you get on it. And I, you know, how many times have we heard golf's 90% metal and yet somebody goes out there and works hundred percent physical to try to get better and they ignore what's right in front of them. I mean, that's you and I like to hunt. We like the outdoors. I mean, there's been many a time I've been sitting on a mountaintop in November and I realized in March, I should have made something different in my game, but because I was so close to it and so wrapped up in the game, I didn't see it until I got away from it. You know, that's why another, that's another aspect when you're teaching people, I ask them what their hobbies are and hopefully for a golf golfer it's not golf because you gotta, you gotta have perspective and step back where you can see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Dave, do you ever look back the same way you do it with your own game with how you've taught players? Like ever thought, man, I wish I would have done a little bit different. Like Rory, we've been talking about Rory. Is there anything in your approach to Rory? If, if hindsight was 2020, you, you would approach it a little differently. Well, I, I think, I think what really hurt Rory to a certain extent is COVID because his teachers are over there and he can't get back over here. So he's had to teach whoever is working with him. Um, uh, I, I, I understand it. It's just been, it's been a tough go. Molinari who's moved, Francesco's moved here to LA and yet his teachers in Europe and he's been struggling. Um, so it, it, it's been tough, but I, I think the, um, the, the aspect of, of keeping a continuity, you know, COVID's kind of screwed everybody over and, uh, it's, 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 it's been a tough time for everybody, especially guys that, that were used to getting a certain amount of teaching and then they couldn't get it. And you're it, and you know, Tal's question is a great one about, you know, striving and changing teachers and doing stuff. Um, you know, uh, anybody that left Butch Harmon, in my opinion, made a mistake because I think Harmon is one of the greatest teachers I've ever been around just because he, he touches on the philosophical side as well as the, the, uh, the pure, pure mental, the pure physical side of it. And I, I think that he, you know, he was one that if you're with him, you're very fortunate because you know, you're going to get really good advice and uh, you know, everybody's out there wants to help you, but you know, you never know. And that's where I was lucky. My dad being my only teacher because I, I didn't have to go anywhere and I wasn't confused by, by different theories. If I might've had an inferior theory to go with, but it, it never changed. So that, that was to my benefit. So to that point, you know, I tell Chase this all the time. I tell it to some of the kids that are around here. You know, you want to go with somebody that's thinking about you when you're not there rather than just when you're there. And certainly your dad was thinking about you when you weren't there because you were his son. You know, Chase is excellent at that. You know, he's always thinking about how he can help someone else get better. But a teacher that is only present in your life whenever you are there with him I'm not sure that's enough. And uh, I hope everybody's listening to that out there right now, because, you know, you teach from the heart, not just from the mind, but from the heart as well. And that's what Chase and I have tried to do here. We teach from the heart too. I mean, we, we're put knowledge with it, but we care. And I, that's what you've been talking about right there. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think the important thing as a teacher, uh, you you tell me somebody that's got a theory and he's going to teach everybody, girl or a guy, the same thing, this secret new thing, and you're all going to get better. Well, they're not because you're you're going to help somebody, but you're going to completely mess up somebody else. So I think the job of a good instructor is to make make the the pupil comfortable. Number one. By whatever, let's see again, go back to Furick, the little loop at the top and all this stuff, but it works and he's comfortable with it. So, and you give them the, the tools to, to be able to figure it out themselves. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of people running around to get over, you know, get over instruction. And that that's one of the basic things. I remember six and seven years old, my dad would have a clinic of five people or six people. He would always start the clinic by saying, I want you to do me a favor. When I'm teaching the person in front of you or behind you, please don't listen to what I'm telling them because it's probably not going to apply to you. The teacher himself, he or she has to work harder because your your job is to analyze that person and what's going to make that person swing or golf game better. And it doesn't it doesn't apply to somebody that's 40 pounds heavier or five inches shorter or six inches taller. I mean, you got a lot of variables you got to work in there. And, and let them build a swing that they're comfortable with. And then you're going to have a successful golfer. You know, Dave, one of the things that that kind of brought up a point, I think it's so important that if, if you're going to go to a coach or an instructor that they have they had to have played the game at some level, at some success at some level, because I feel like if I went and got a golf lesson for a putting lesson from you or get a golf lesson from how neither of y'all are ever going to overcoach, you're never going to go down this road of too, too in depth or too deep or, or, or confuse me with a ton of different thoughts because you guys have been there and you realize what it takes to play at the highest level. And I think some of these guys that, you know, learn the golf swing by study and, you know, say they went down a morad path with Mac and like going deep into all that stuff, you can really get people lost by going, you know, each part of the swing throughout the whole process. And so, well, I don't think, you've got to play at the, on the PGA tour level to be a great coach. Cause there's plenty that didn't, but I think that it goes back to that point that if you're searching for coaches, find somebody that at least play college golf or could play to a scratch level or play to some level. So they understand, you know, kind of what it felt like to play in the heat of the moment. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And back to Rory, I mean, that I, my success on tour and being known to being a good short game uh, player, I think led credibility to him for me and that's why i think we hit it off so well i think the the biggest thing to me is that uh and, and you said it completely correctly i thought at the start my dad was was really he would tick me off because i'd come back from southern cal i'd come back on the weekends and i'd go out there and he would he would tell me you don't need anything just go play and i'm i'm looking for instruction he said just go play and it, it, he 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 would not, he wouldn't tell me anything for, if he had told me something the week before, he wouldn't tell me anything again for the next three weeks. He had me ingrain what I had until I went out there and I, I got it in my, in my mind. So I just wasn't thinking of all these mechanical things. And you mentioned my dad died when Ronnie was 13, my younger son. And by the time he's 15, Ronnie became my instructor, taking the place of my dad. And we went to Mac O'Grady, you mentioned O'Grady and We'd have an hour lesson and on the way home, Ronnie would condense that lesson, which had obviously a ton of stuff in it, in about a two or three minute thing that, that pertained to me, and that was it. And it, it simplified what would have been a confusing time to me because Mac was a brilliant instructor, sure. but it, 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 it put you in the wrong side of your brain and you couldn't, you couldn't function because you got so many things that you shouldn't have to be thinking about. You know, I, I tell people, I said, can you throw a dart? And they say, yeah. And this gets back to the putting is you get back a dart. You're going at the bullseye. You're throwing it at the bullseye. Well, the hole in the putting green is my bullseye. And yet you watch people come in and they line up the line on the ball and they take the two practice strokes. I love the two practice strokes. I just go nuts because I'd be on the next tee already. I'll have made my putt and have already been on the next tee. Well, these, they're still lining it up and thinking about it and thinking about the latest six things they're working on. If they think about it, it'll make it go in the hole. And to me, it's just not that complicated. I want to get up and if it's not a matter of not caring, but it's just trusting in what you have. And you, you know, you ask somebody, well, why do you take practice strokes when you putt? And they go, well, you know, I'm just doing it, you know, to get the feel of what I'm going to do. I said, oh, do you play pool? He 
He said, yeah, I play pool. I said, good. You put the cue stick a foot left of the cue ball and practice your stroke before you get up behind it? And they go, no, no. I said, well, why not? This is the closest thing to putting, hand-eye coordination. And I said, but I tell you one thing you're going to do when you have that cue stick behind the ball, you're going to have that cue stick going back and forth. You're going to have feeling and then you're going to roll it. And that's just what we want to do when we're putting. But oh my God, people think putting's really tough. And it's got, if you, if you follow a few simple things, it, it is a very, I think the easiest part of the game. Your hands are only moving three or four inches and they're not, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing what people do in the, and like you said, Hal, and trying to get better and, and work at this stuff. It, it just, you know, to me, to me, it, I, the first thing when you give somebody a lesson, I ask them to sign their signature on a piece of paper for me. And it takes them three or four seconds. Then I say, okay, look at your own signature right below it. I want you to duplicate that. And I want you to take 15 to 20 seconds because I want the, I want the H and Hal to be the same height, the same width of the A, just make it identical. Well, you can't do it. You can't do the first letter in your own name. And the reason why is because it's something that should be in your subconscious, but you are trying so hard to get this right that you can't unlock your potential. And therein lies the fact why people struggle with it. I hope everybody's listening out there, Dave. That's pr pretty brilliant what you're talking about right there. You know, you, I, I talk about it in here all the time. You know, our, our golf game is like our fingerprint. It's ours. And so much of the time we're trying to take what other people tell us and, and add it to what we already have. And a la confusion starts to set in. And, you know, I tweeted something out not long ago that said, you know, swing change predominantly is for a younger person. Once we get older, we kind of are who we are. And, you know, from that point, it's, are you comfortable in your own skin? You mentioned that a minute ago, you know, can you live with it? Can you excel at what you do best? Can you acknowledge what you aren't as good? Take inventory of your game and play accordingly so yeah it, it it to me i'll tell you a quick story uh i was at the masters and how i got to sit down at this table with this gentleman i have no idea but it was just he and i it's about 1975 i think uh i was about my fourth or fifth masters and i was sitting with byron nelson and I'm not a historian or anything, but I knew sure as hell in 45, he won 11 times in a row. What I didn't know is he'd entered 23 tournaments and won 18 of them. So it was a reasonably good year. And so I said to him, I said, what, can you tell me what you were thinking? He got this big smile on his face. And he said, you know, Dave, he said, I was in West Texas and I was warming up for the West Coast swing, getting ready to go. And I discovered a th swing thought. And that is the only thought I used the entire year. And I'm sitting there and he said that. And I didn't ask him what it was because it didn't apply to me. What applied to me is the fact that you can overthink this thing really quick. And I'm thinking, and I finished the top five that year in the Masters. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, I've got five or six things dad and I are working on. And here's a gentleman that only had one thing. He went to the driving range. He said, I'd use my swing thought, warm up, and now I'd go play. I'm thinking, my gosh, I mean, the average person who's listening to what the announcers say, reading the latest things in the golf magazines and stuff, oh, man, this is great. Well, you know, all your listeners out there, the tip that they had a month ago that was going to be the key to them getting better, they've now moved on from that to the next tip, and after one after another, and you can't perfect it. And it's just, I learned so much talking to Byron. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, I just, and it, to me, it just simplified it, you know, but people, and you alluded to one of your questions way earlier is the fact that, you know, don't overthink this thing. Don't, don't try to, don't try. Well, basically don't try. I mean, just know what, figure out if you have a good instructor that gives you the basics of what you should work on, then work on that and don't be looking for something else. Cause I'll tell you what, the next TV, the next golf tournament, the announcer is going to say that, you're going to hear him say, oh, you really released the putter. And I about throw up because I do not want to release a putter. Now, I don't want to desell it. But my big thing is if I'm, if I'm teaching somebody, the first word they learn is I don't want them to try. 
okay? Because they can't try. If they try to sign a signature again, they, it's not going to be good. But the second word I don't want them to use is I don't want them to hit a putt. I want to hit a drive. I want to hit a seven iron. I want to hit a wedge. I want to hit a sand shot. But I want to roll the putt. I do not want to hit it. And so I want to have the feeling of the ball staying on the putter quite a while so I can just I can feel the roll. I know I control the distance better that way. But the average person doesn't go there. I mean, and yet an announcer is going to say that, and somebody's going to sit there and go, oh, you're supposed to release your putter. Okay, well, if you do that, then it's going to be a right for a right-handed player. It's going to be a right-handed stroke. And <laughs> you're using power when you should be using finesse. But that's just a typical example of, of and they all say it, and maybe they weren't, some of them were good tour pros, but not many of them aren't, but they think they're saying the right thing. It's completely backwards. So I've heard you say two things that you think are qualities of good putters being steel mm -hmm. and rolling the, the ball. So give us your version of what you think are qualities of a really good putter. Well, qualities of a really good putter is knowing how to read greens. I mean, I have you sign your signature, so you know you can't try. And now I'm going to step into the realm of where where you think uh, you need to work on. And I say, okay, here's here's a 12 foot putt, and I always have something that breaks about six inches. So it obviously goes one direction. The other I said, I want to see your routine because all your listeners, their error is going to come out of their routine, not their stroke. So they start out, and the comical part is that. I want them to go to the low side of the hole because you you read a book till they get towards you. You don't tilt it away from you. So if the ball's breaking from right to left and you go to the left and you're looking, now you can see the hill. If you make the mistake of circling a hole, now when you look on the other side, it's going to look like a totally different putt and you're going to be totally confused. Okay? So I go behind it. When I go behind the hole and I look, you know, look back at it, I'm, I'm looking at the spot the ball's going to enter. And this is not the spot if I'm shooting a bow and arrow or a rifle at it, not the center of the hole. If it's breaking six inches, it's going to be coming in at about three o'clock. It's going to be coming way to the right. And you have to see that as the center of the hole, the entrance point. And that's what's comical when people put the line on the ball and they line it up because generally it's not going to be high enough. You know, and somebody just misses it. Well, there's a hell of a difference between just missing it on the right hand side, on the side it should be breaking in from. You missed it by a half an inch or something. But if you miss it on the low side by half an inch, you've missed your putt by five inches because the ball should be entering on the other side of the, you know, higher on the hole. And what gets me is that in this bad routine, I guess, well, the biggest thing for me, I come back behind the ball, bend down, stand up, maybe four paces behind the ball. I come walking into it and I'm not taking a practice stroke. The only, the only person that I really had to take a practice stroke was Annika Sorenstam and she had she's mechanical she had to so I made her do her practice stroke standing right back before she ever steps toward the ball facing the hole looking at the hole just making I don't care how many she takes but when she goes to walk into it I wanted her ready to get in and let it go so when I come up to a ball I put my my right hand my right foot about where it's going to end my left foot's not even close I put the putter down behind the ball now I look out at the hole and set my left foot, bend my knees, get myself set, all looking at the hole, just like I was throwing a dart at a target, okay? But the average person that takes these two practice strokes or so at the ball now comes stepping up into the ball, square up, and generally is too square. And the ball is going to be, ten you're going to tend to miss it on the right-hand side, which is the last place I want to miss a putt. Because if I miss a putt on the left, which I, I would rather do right left than right, because right, and then there's something wrong with the stroke. But there's nothing wrong with the putt that's missed left, and all I have to do is raise my hands up slightly because I want my left hand to be my direction hand. And I guess that would be the final thing I would tell. The one, and I don't have a bunch of drills, but the one drill I want somebody to be able to hold a putter with their left hand and make a stroke. Well, the first thing they can't do is release the putter. Because you can't, you got to forward press slightly, let the putter go back and then just have this feel of the roll and going through and your left hand stays firm. I mean, I was taught to keep the, the putter grip vertical so that it doesn't point back toward my belly button where if you, if you release the putter, now the butt of the club is going back towards your belly button. You've released it all right, 
but it's hard to make the ball stay online. Um, but, but my biggest thing, and I tell people, I say, I have never backed off a putt. And they look at me like I'm nuts. I said, unless the fan stands fell down or there was a loud noise or something, I'd back off. Because once I get in and I, I've set my feet looking at the hole, I could close my eyes. I could keep looking at the hole like speed does occasionally. Um, because I, I set my body up. I can see the exact line this ball's going. And it's going to go in most of the time. Rather than hoping it goes in and, and going through all these things and taking all this time. Uh, and that's why I say the routine is highly important. And it depends, Hal, and you know this well. Chase, you do too. I mean, it depends if a person's a fast player like Lanny Watkins or an extremely slow player, not extremely slow, but Nicholas would come to mind that he, he gets over that putt and he didn't hit it till he was ready. And it, it just, just differs. And that's your job as a coach is to figure out how that person's going to be comfortable. You know, I mean, we couldn't make Lanny Watkins go slow if he tried, you know, and you wouldn't want to. The speed, you know, I, I would rather have a fast player than a slow player myself so so dave what do you say to guys like say a crenshaw or a faxon or some of the you know tiger talks about releasing his right hand a lot you know you, your preference was a little bit more of a left hand lead kind of a stable st call it a stabler release or whatever you know in your words whatever you want to call it what do you say to the guys that kind of released it a little bit more i mean would you would you change that some or would you let them get a, go with it and work on their routine like how do you coach those players Again, everybody's different. I mean, Crenshaw and I put out a, we have a, a tape together we made together. And while our strokes differ slightly, it's all about feel. He released slightly. I've worked with Tiger. And Tiger, I just laugh at him because I, and I think when he had his trouble and he came back and he had trouble with the chipping, because he tends to release his right hand a bit. But the thing I like in Tigers is he'll putt right-handed with just the right hand where I putt with the left. Okay, but his his grip is not pointing back that much. His right hand keeps going. It's not like it flips at the ball. He's still going through really solid going through. Uh, Faxon, who's now working with Rory, I think, uh, is, I think, is a brilliant teacher. I think he's, he's perfect. Um, again, we're, we're all slightly different. I mean, I'm, that, that's the other thing. There's, there's no right way or wrong way to do what we're doing. It's just a, a matter of something that fits your personality. You know, Crenshaw's got, you can just see the feel, you know, and he, he is the toe hang putter like I, I grew up using, same, similar thing. And we had more in common than we don't have in common. I guarantee you that because, I mean, it was, we talked back and forth and it was really fun to do it with him. He was a little nervous going into it. I said, we'll be fine. We did it up at Silverado. And uh, it was fun. It was fun to pick pick his brain because it it again it, it gets back to just you know a good putter is going to see the hole and know the thing's going to go in. If it doesn't go in, they don't worry about it, and you just you know you move on from it. But I, I think the the bad putter and the person that did, dies over it is he's trying so hard to make it happen um, that it that it just doesn't. I mean. Perfect example in my ear was Weisskopf, uh, who I'll never forget. He came out on this. We had the super seniors we played in Minneapolis and we played in Houston. And he and I, he came out for his first time and I was paired with he and Johnny Miller. And he got on the green. He said to me, he says, what do you teach people when you teach them to putt? And I said, well, it all depends. Everybody's different. I said, are you talking about yourself? Or are you talking about other people? He said, well, no, what would you tell me? He said, Heck, I said, I'd like to, I've been wanting to tell you this for 40 years, but you never asked. I said, I hate the way you put your, your second finger of your left hand down, like you're going to make your left hand go to the hole. In reality, it stops your hand as soon as you touch the ball. And he looks at me and I said, yeah, just, you just overlap your, your second finger, your left hand over, over your little, little finger of your, of your right hand below it. Don't stick it way down. And you'll notice how your hand doesn't turn white. It's just as there. It's comfortable. I loved it. He, he made one bad putt in 18 holes and he made, I think it was eight birdies. I mean, I said, and that's, you know, you should have asked me 40 years ago, shouldn't you? And he just laughed. It was great. It was a great moment. <laughs> so Dave, we've been talking about putting, but you were known for your short game. So, uh, I see everybody trying to, there, there's a lot of chipping 
uh, struggles right now, I think. And give us your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, if a pro does something wrong, it's generally chipping. Um, I, when people come to me for putting, I, I really want to look, and I've done it at everybody I've worked with. I want to look at the chipping. Um, I was taught by my dad and I hated it. That's the one thing I hated is he wanted me to chip with seven irons and six irons and I didn't like it. And when I came on tour, all I had was a pitching wedge at 48 degrees and a sand wedge at 56. And I was perfectly fine with that until Kite talked me into, I needed a 60. So I got a 60. So then I interjected a 54 degree wedge and then my 48 degree of my, of my pitching wedge. And you know, I ended up doing a lot of chipping with, with my 58 or 60 degree wedge. Right now I use a 58 and a 52, but I would, then the reason why, and people don't realize this, I had back to back Stephen Gallagher, Ryder Cup player from England. Um, and, and then behind him was Francesco Molinari and they both came in and both of them were doing the chipping and uh, Europeans ship differently than we do. They put their feet extremely close together, which I've never figured out. And then they get in the bunker, of course, and they spread, everybody spreads out in the bunker, but they tend to, they tend to keep their heels pretty darn close together, which I can't do. I've had, I was always taught chipping to put my weight on my left foot. I was taught to, I don't choke down much and I stand as tall as I can possibly stand. And again, that gets back to our friend, Hubert Green, who, was one of the best chippers I ever saw. And he choked that sucker so far down that it was unbelievable. But, and I've never teach anybody to do this, but he was just brilliant. And consequently, these guys like Gallagher and Francesco, well, they got in the bunkers. Both of them were having trouble getting out of the traps. And I handed them my wedge and they both did really good. And, and Francesco was, we were both using the same exact Nike wedge and Mine just worked way better than his. And so I asked both of them, Gallagher was using a D3 on his, on his wedge, weight-wise, and Francesco was a D2 and a half. I, I, my wedge is D6 and a half. And that's one of the things. So I called Mike Taylor in Fort Worth that made the Nike wedges. And I asked him, I said, I've been out here 50 years. Have I not, did I miss something? And this I probably did. And he says, no, he said, I just build what they want. And I said, well, they, you're telling me they don't know what they want. And I, <laughs> I laughed. And right now Gallagher is using the D seven and a half. Molinari is using the D six and a half like I do. And yet you get these kids, they know the loft on the club, but I promise you every other one doesn't even know what, what the swing weight is. And like my, my sandwich has a slightly, my 58 has a slightly bigger grip than any of my other clubs because I want the feel. It's like having a thicker grip and putting you don't grab it so tight. If you have a pencil grip or something, you tend to grab the club fairly tight when you want to have all this feel. Well, we're all around the green. We're hitting a ton of feel shots. And most people, again, how your point is well taken, that is where the struggles are. And to make one quick observation, when I teach this, I teach two shots. I teach a high shot and a low shot. And you do not want to mix them up. Because if, if you get up there and you have this simple chip, the pin's right in the middle of the green, you've got 35 feet of green to work with, you go high, low, or anything, the average person that's going to screw it up says, well, oh, I'll just chip it up there. This is a cinch. Well, if you go higher and you mean to, it's going to stop too soon. If it goes lower, it's going to go too far. So you teach two different theories. And you, you're, um, for me, on a low shot, I'm again, like in putting, I'm pushing it back with my left hand, and I'm, I'm not lifting it up going back, although that's my bad habit. And then you want the left hand to go through and I'll have, I'll have them chip one handed and you can't flip at it because the average person, when they chip that, that the, the wedge is going to end up left of the target and at least waist high. If I'm hitting a low shot, that club isn't getting a foot off the ground. When I go through it, just, there's no reason I'm not trying to help it up. I'm trying to hit it down. So there's your, your point well taken, Al, and that, that's why I spend a lot of time with the chipping because I think that derails a lot of good players. Forget the amateurs, you know, and they're, you know, you can only watch while well, working with Phil. I used to have fun contests with him because he would always try to chip the high shot. And I, of course, I'd, if I had to, I'd go low. So he'd beat my brains out with his 64 because I couldn't make it. I couldn't handle some of these shots he had. But as soon as I beat him on one, now it was my turn 
turn to choose and I'd immediately go to a low shot, which he didn't like. So it's a matter of learning the two. And then that's going to make you a better, better player around the green because you're going to hit a specific shot for a particular problem that you're facing. How do you well, hit- I think? Go ahead, oh, Chase. I was just going to say, talk real quick, Dave, on the high one. How do you hit the high one? High when your weight on both shots, your weights on the left. Okay. Uh, the other, th- and I'll get to that. Well, the one the other thing I do is I turn under 30 yards. I turn my left foot's turned out toward the target slightly. My right foot is also turned in, the same as the left, because that helps me get off my back foot. Because on both of them, you want you want your weight on the left and not moving it. And on the high shot, I'm taking the club outside more and I'm coming down and it depends on how much spin I'm trying to put on it, but you're literally using the different part of the wedge. Now, when I say different part of the wedge, I didn't mention on the low shot, and this is a shot that Dale Douglas taught me way back in 1972, is I stand extremely close for a low chip chip shot. Raymond Floyd comes to mind instantly. He's one of the best chippers I ever saw. And I mean, I saw him at Augusta a foot off the green using a six iron, I think, with a putting stroke and anybody in their right mind would be putting this because there's no grain in the round, the greens there at Augusta. You can putt from anywhere if you had to. And yet he stands close. And when the club's almost vertical, the heel of the putter is not touching the ground. And I'm hitting it slightly more on the toe and I can hood it. I mean, I could put it on top of a sprinkler and I can hit a perfect chip off that. I mean, there's no, I mean, I, cause I, because I'm only my, I'm going to say less than a half an inch of the toe of the club is hitting the ground. So again, that helps you because you're on Bermuda or Kukui or Bent or Zoysia, whatever it might be, some sticky, some's not. You don't want to have the whole club being used. Now, to answer your question, Chase, when you go to a high shot, now the ball's farther away from me because I'm going to use the bounce of the club. And again, it's a matter of knowing that the club face itself is what gets the ball in the air, not you trying to hoist it up. So my final final thing I do when I'm standing there and the ball's farther away and I'm going to hit a high shot and I'm aiming slightly further left because I'm visualizing this fade, the ball's going to hit the ground and spin to the right, I would, I would tend to automatically stand taller. I shake my shoulders, stand as tall as I can possibly stand so there's no upward motion. Because the last thing for your listeners to understand is that as we play and you wonder why you can't finish around your last four or five holes, you don't play as good as you should. Okay. Most people choke up so far. Literally I'll ask them. I said, do you not know, think that's your ball? Why are you bending over so far? Because when you come up now, the club can't do what it's got to do. So I want to stand tall, shake my shoulders, stay there and just let my hands and arms do the, do the shot. And there's no, there's not, you're cutting down the access, Oops, excuse me, it's duck hunting season. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's Junior calling me. I'll shut him off for a second. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's just, to me, there's a lot to be learned and I love it. And that's why I love the teaching of the short game because there's people that, and good players, they just don't realize, you know, what they're doing some of the time. And it, again, if once you have a specific shot in mind and it gets back, it gets to the long game. I think the hardest, one of the hard, God, David's going to call everybody here. Sorry. Sorry, Al. Hang on. That's all right. Uh, the, uh, I, I think one of the hardest shots is you hit a ball straight down the middle, longest drive you ever hit on this particular hole and the pins in the middle of the green and all of a sudden, oh, man, I got this. Well, this is about to be your worst shot you hit because you haven't thought it out. You could put it in the trees, and the tree tells you whether you're going over it, around it, under it, whatever you're going to do. And you may hit a really good shot because this tree in front of you forced you to picture it. And that, to me, is the fun part of the teaching is you want to explain to people what, you know, what is going to help them help their game the most. I mean, you're talking about shots coming into a green. I mean, I always been taught to use two clubs. I mean, you got an eight iron in your hand. Well, is it an eight nine or is it an eight seven? In reality, you're talking about three clubs. And yet the average person, we've all used caddies. You, you stand there and you, you have your eight iron halfway out of the bag. And you say, what do you think, a good eight? And what the caddy said, if, if the caddy knows you and he, he says, yeah, just feather it up there. Meaning he thinks it's a nine. Or he says, yeah, 
hit a good one, hit a good, good solid one, meaning he thinks it's probably a seven and you better stomp on this thing. It'd be a lot easier. And I always did this. I'd ask the caddy. I said, what two clubs do you think it is? I put the, and I don't tell him what I'm thinking about. Now I may be thinking seven, eight. He may be thinking eight, nine. So obviously I'm an eight and eight. So it's just, there's so many things that people, and that's why it's fun, Hal, and you know, and you too, Chase, is that when you're teaching people stuff that's going to make them better, I mean, it's, it's a combination. There's a little bit of mechanical stuff in there, obviously, but for the most part, it's fun to get inside, you know, picturing Byron Nelson, one swing thought, go out there and enjoy it. You got a heck of a chance to do a whole lot better. So one of the things you said a second ago that I found very intriguing, I love it, I want to go back to it, is you said the tree makes you make a decision. And yep. Jason and I talk all the time. I mean, I am heavy into a committed decision. I mean, I believe you have to picture the shot and then you have to totally commit to that shot. That tree analogy makes you commit to a certain shot but if there's nothing out there you never really commit to something somebody doesn't visually see it before they hit it so how how do you hit something if you have not made a decision on what you want to do well i mean it starts it starts with realizing that you're anything you do in life well <laughs> you set out and you want to win a tournament okay you hope you win a tournament you practice to win a tournament but do you step up on your first practice round on, let's say, the Masters, and do you stand there thinking, I've won this tournament? I mean, I, ho I don't hope I win it. You know, you step up, and then you – I remember my very first time I'd read the book Psycho-Cybernetics, and I finished reading it with, like, reading sandpaper. But I finished <laughs> reading it. My dad wanted me to read it, and I underlined it, and I took two things out of it. One, when you play, you have to be aggressive. Okay, which was stupid for as short as I was, but that's what I did. But the other thing is that you had to picture that you've already accomplished your goal of what you want to accomplish. Okay, that's why a lot of times when you win your first tournament, if you're a good player, you're going to win more, and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna take each step you take and learn something from it. Well, I stepped up at Southern Hills in, in 1970 at Southern Hills in Tulsa. And I'd finished reading this book and I'm out there at seven o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning playing a practice round. I came to that, that 18th green, that, that, uh, hole. And I'm picturing 20,000 people are going to be there Sunday cheering for me when I win this thing. Unbelievable. Little do I know that I'm coming down on Sunday, Kathy's staying because she's set my eight months pregnant with Ronnie at the time. And I'm paired with Arnold Palmer. And if he wins, he wins the Grand Slam. And if I win, I win my first major. And when I got to 18, there were like 30,000 people around that thing. I never forgot that. And it made it awful easy spending the whole week knowing that I already won the tournament. And I've done it a few times when I didn't win, but I came close to it. It's just a matter of getting in a mindset that you're out there. You're, you're not worried about stuff. How can I be worried if I've already won it? You know, it's just, it's just you, we play little games with ourselves. And it's just... It, it, it makes it much, much easier, much easier to become a successful golfer if you spend as much time mentally preparing if your, your question about having a tree in the fairway. I mean, I take people out, and I, I will literally put them behind trees. I'll say, what kind of shots are you going to hit? Well, now the, all of a sudden their mind starts thinking because in the fairway we just go brain dead. That's like when's the last time you walked up on a par three with two clubs? I mean – Everybody, oh, yeah, it's a seven iron. Okay, so you pull a seven iron, but there may be more wind than there's been in quite a while. And the other three guys all come short. Now, do you take the time to walk back there to the cart and get your, your six iron? Uh-uh, you're going to hit a killer seven iron. And it's just, it's just the mindset people have that's not good. You know, and that's why guys like you and I that have played, we can come from the aspect and we've been there. We know what it takes and when these people learn it, they learn it a hell of a lot better from, from someone like ourselves. Well, Dave, this has been real informative. Uh, I know that uh, I've had an unbelievable amount of respect for you. And uh, you're not only a great teacher, but you're a really good person. Your family, everybody in your family's great people. And uh, I value our friendship. So thanks for being on Be The Right Club today. Well, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, Hal and Chase. Nice being with you, too. It, uh, 
uh, again, it, it means a lot to be out there with our friends and for us to reach out and touch base again. It, it's fun. I hope our paths cross more often. I'm, uh, they say they're playing the legends down in Houston this year. So I'll be down there. I hope I hope you get a chance to see you. All right. I'll try to come out and see you. Okay, good. You guys have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Dave. All right. Thank, Thanks, thank you, guys. Dave. Be the right club today. Yes!